waiting for the, to make sure that the technology is rolling. It doesn't roll anymore, but um, it's like the old days. But as soon as I get the nod, we're there. Now I'm looking looking at the. Uh, okay, great. Well, welcome to another of our uh, speaker series events. As usual, I want to thank the LRC for allowing us to invade their space and to the broadcast and film faculty and students who are assisting us today in the uh, streaming and recording of the event, and to Steve and uh, the, all the crew who helped set up. Again, thanks so much for uh, assisting us. There's, there's room, and we'll get some more chairs in the back there if we can, so that you can all sit down. A lot of people I meet here at Centennial, and those I meet in my travels in the industry, ask me, what does it take to build a career in journalism? Well, there are many answers. Of course, uh, because I teach here, um, they expect me to say, well, get a fundamental education in the profession, and then get out there and learn by doing. But there's one other thing I think that I've learned about this business that you cannot teach. It's just as important to your survival in journalism or broadcasting or advertising or corporate communications um, as any assignment might be or as any degree or diploma might be, and it's something I suspect our guest never had to study to know. Peter Kent is naturally curious, and I think it's a sense that has driven him in his career entirely. Yes, he's got all those necessary skills, the ability to find and tell a good story. He learned that in talk radio back in B.C. in the 60s. Yes, he's that old. Just look at uh, the conviction to pursue uh, newsmakers. He covered separatist Rennie Levesque's rise to premiership in Quebec in the 70s. The skill to deliver the news with authority. He was a CBC television news anchor uh, in the 70s when the National got going, and then later on Global when uh, he anchored there for a period of time in the 90s, still does occasionally. The nerve and the self-confidence it takes to uh, ask the tough questions and take on the tough assignments covering the war in Vietnam and such African hotspots as uh, the fall of Idi Amin and the famine in Ethiopia, and the self-confidence to work in the United States market. But every step of the way, he's also been motivated and guided by that innate, intense sense of curiosity. Why else would he have tried his hand at both public and private broadcasting? Why else tell both stories to uh, audiences, both as a reporter and as a producer? And most recently, exploring politics as both a political reporter and a politician during his bid last year to win a seat uh, federally in Toronto. Why else would he have been recognized, too, for his work with four Emmy nominations and most recently the President's Award for Excellence in Broadcasting, from the Radio and Television News Directors Association. So, as he speaks today, listen to our guest for all of the insights and his advice on succeeding as a professional journalist, but look and listen especially to the power of his curiosity. Welcome, Peter Kent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ted. Um, and thank you for uh, for coming out today, and um, and uh, we'll get to questions pretty quickly, I think, because I'd rather talk about what what you're interested in than uh, than rabbiting on about uh, about uh, the golden days of television as I as I perceive them, or or the best days that uh, that I had a privilege to uh, experience. Just to set the record straight, I'm coming uh, here today uh, as what uh, the former leader of the Green Party, Jim Harris. Uh, characterized me as a faceless broadcast executive. Uh, I'm out of the editorial stream at, uh, at Can West and Global Television uh, because of my decision to uh, wander into the world of politics last year. Um, and if I learned one thing after uh, four decades working in the news business, politics is a lot harder than it looks. Um, uh, although I'm just biding my time waiting for another go next time. I won't talk about uh, how I got into um, into journalism and radio and television, uh, because although I'll certainly take questions on it if you'd like, uh, because uh, the situation and conditions and and uh, employment um, uh, possibilities are very different than they were back in uh, in the early 60s. 
Um, and I won't talk about, um, uh, or I won't start out talking about um, war stories, either distant or more recent, because uh, um, I know that you've been working um, this semester on, on civic politics, and I'd like to talk about that because I've got a few war stories to tell, too. Um, I think the municipal uh, uh, election um, arena is a really interesting one. It's a fascinating one from both um, the political and the uh, journalistic side. And I think we've got a really interesting campaign this time. I'm in up to my, uh, up to my ears, both in the Merrill campaign, um, working in the, uh, in the back of the Pittsfield campaign, and helping out a number of um, the councillor candidates across the city. And the reason I'm doing that is um, I think that in the past couple of years, particularly during the last federal election, um, partisan politics, provincial and federal partisan politics, um, uh, were drawn into the municipal arena. Um, and I firmly believe that municipal politics um, don't work when you've got partisan ideologies. I think that City Hall needs... Um, left-wingers, centrists, and right-wingers, but, but most of all, they need people that can uh, achieve consensus because that City Hall just won't work if there are blocks of, uh, of, um, of political cabals, and that's what we've seen develop over the last three years, and we've seen three years of pretty unproductive um, um, effort at City Hall. Um, it's also encouraged... Um, uh, an environment of secrecy and of um, a, a certain amount of duplicity in the way different groups on City Hall go into, uh, into meetings. Um, it, it, it's just not working properly. So anyway, I'm, just to declare my, uh, my stripe, um, I've been working with the Pittsfield campaign for a change at the top at City Hall and working to try and shift the balance and get some fresher, younger faces um, on City Hall who are perhaps not quite as cynical about the... Um, uh, municipal, municipal political scene. Um, the the um, decision, when I came to the decision to get into politics, it was basically that after four decades of basically doing public policy as a journalist, because that's what you do as a journalist, you, you um, tend to keep your, person, your personal political inclinations uh, under a bushel, uh, but you're out there and you're reporting, and a, a good journalist... Uh, essentially looks at all of the factors and, and aspects of the story and reports them in a, we used to call it objectivity. When I was in, the holy grail in the 60s was objectivity and, and, and a, you know, so-and-so is an objective journalist. Well, it's, it's an impossible quest uh, to be absolutely objective, uh, but I think these days it's fair and balanced. Not necessarily fair and balanced in the Fox sense, because I think there's a, a certain wonderful uh, sarcasm there. Um, but fair and balanced in, in the sense of fair play and accuracy. Above all, accuracy. Uh, there will always be subjective decisions made on to, as to what you can put into a 200-word a story uh, that you um, might not be able to include in something that short that would be very, uh, could in fact be pivotal, pivotal in a 1,000 in a or 2,000-word story. And the same between a 30-second voiceover and a newscast as opposed to a, um, uh, a great uh, 15 or 20-minute uh, mini-doc on the national. The, um, the uh, coverage of politics has been complicated uh, in the past decade in Canada um, by the emergence as the columnists. Generally, columnists on newspapers tend to be the best writers. Um, and there, the creation of the National Post, with its obvious right of center um, uh, take on events of the day, counterbalancing finally the, the Toronto Star, which was way over on, on the left, and the Globe and Mail that used to be in the center right, but now is finding itself, for competitive reasons, trying to get more of the Star's um, uh, subscriptions, subscribers, and readers, because the Post has taken a good part of their of their conservative readership, except for businessmen who repeat, read both the report on business and the financial post. Uh, and and by putting the Christy Blatchfords and the Roy McGregors and the Andrew Coins on the front pages and and you know the various of the of the great star columnists as well on the front pages 
a lot of Canadians who grew up expecting fair and balanced content, absolute, absolute objectivity, although they, they never really got it, um, that the columnist's opinion is now starting to color, and it has colored and affected both the headlines of the straight news stories and the content of the straight news stories. Um, so it's getting very confusing for a lot of Canadians who say, you know, and, and generally people affiliate or, or, or buy the newspaper which is closest to, to the reinforcement of their own uh, perspectives, either political or social or, or socioeconomic, uh, on the stories of the day. And if we have a problem in Canada, it's that too many people are single source consumers of news and information. Too many post readers read only the post. Uh, too many star readers read only the star. Uh, too many people, or actually not enough people watch the national. An awful lot of people watch private television with a very different product, um, which sometimes doesn't go into the depth necessary to create an informed uh, news consumer. And then you've got TVO, which is trying to do its thing over here on, on, on one end of the public broadcasting spectrum, um, but all of a sudden we're finding that, that their, um, their news and information content is, is shrinking tighter and tighter around, uh, around Steve Takens. So it does a great job, but, but I think we need uh, a slightly wider spectrum at, at TVO. And TVO is still my idea of, a, of, of a, an ideal public broadcaster. Uh, no commercials. It doesn't run uh, Wonderful World of Disney in prime time. You know, it basically it knows what its what its um, mission is, and it and it focuses on it. CBC is getting closer and closer to the inevitable um, um, makeover, uh, and I think the current uh, leadership has is, is driving it over the precipice faster than it might have gone naturally. But basically, we've got to get back, I believe, to a national public broadcaster. Um, uh, CBC regional, CBC local, um, the mandate was there in the 50s when there weren't very many local stations and there wasn't a networking and a, and a delivery of uh, an ability to cross-pollinate uh, news and information coverage across the country, but private broadcasters or provincial public broadcasters are doing that better and better these days, and unfortunately, for a lot of reasons, um, uh, local newscasts on the CBC network simply aren't being watched. Um, they're being used, for right or wrong, um, by the main CBC, by, by, by News World, as sort of news-gathering engines, uh, which then allows News World, uh, in some ways, to compete unfairly, because they do receive, I don't know what it is now, 80 or 90 cents per subscriber, cable subscriber. They, News World gets a lot of guaranteed income simply because of the way the CRTC wrote, wrote their license. Um, and I think that in some ways, CBC is costing Canadian taxpayers as much as it does because they're not putting enough and, and, and not delivering on their national product because too much of their money is going into regional operations as a way of subsidizing News World, which is a valuable and it's an, it's an excellent uh, news service. Where can I go from here? Talk a little bit, talk a little bit about um, because of your connection to CBC, Another, yes. another declaration, because you, were, you did work there. Talk a yes. little bit about the, the birth of the national and why that was such an important move, both in terms of broadcast and in terms of the journalists who participated. I remember one the journal. Yeah. Okay. Well, CBC was the only game in town in, in the 50s and 60s. CTV came along quite quickly and developed a, um, um, uh, a rival network. But news and current affairs, the golden years of news and current affairs and public broadcasting, um, were the, the 60s and the 70s, and then when we created the journal in the early 80s. I was away for a while. I, I went to the States, went to Africa and, and Asia, but in the 70s, technology allowed the CBC to really cover the country with live events. Until, until then, um, CBC information programming was largely the national at 11 o'clock at night. It was must-watch television. It was very good television. Um, but it, 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 it didn't cover breaking news in, in any real sense. Uh, Lloyd Robertson had been reading The National, and I was his producer and writer for a while in the early 70s. Uh, I'd worked at CTV, I'd worked in radio, I'd worked at Global briefly before it went into receivership. Global went on the air back in 1974 up here in, uh, in uh, North York. 
And almost immediately, because they launched in the middle of the year, they went into receivership because all the advertising, or most of the advertising in town, had been committed to, to other commercial broadcasters. Um, so I left at that point, and that was my opportunity to join CBC as a writer for The National and for Lloyd, and then eventually a producer on News Magazine, which was a weekly, it was a great, if you ever have a chance to go into the archives and look at the old News Magazine half hours, we did some, uh, not just me, but... Uh, there are some wonderful half-hour programs on uh, the civil rights movement, on Vietnam, on uh, the big issues of day, separatism in Quebec, uh, international issues around the world. Um, and it was a wonderful time to work in public broadcasting because we had three essential crews on News Magazine, and you'd be sent out the door on an assignment on a, uh, on a uh, Monday morning, and you'd be expected to have to deliver an edited half-hour double-system film program uh, two weeks down the road. And each of the other crews had the same obligation. So we were always leapfrogging. Um, and as you all know, the, um, the post-production process was a lot more ponderous than it is today. Processing film, transporting film, editing film, editing sound, uh, mixing sound, um, and then dubbing it onto a, uh, onto a great huge two-inch uh, piece of tape in a lot of cases, to play it back to air. So that was a wonderful time, and it gave a lot of people, and many of us, uh, I never did get a university degree, by the way. I got sidetracked. I was a Canadian officer uh, in, in, the, in the Canadian Navy Air Wing, uh, going to university out on the West Coast in the Naval Dockyard, and actually didn't graduate because that year they brought in the first, the first um, strand of bilingualism in the, in the Canadian forces, and applied it only against naval pilots. And because I'd gone into university straight from grade 11, uh, from Alberta, of all places, with one year of French, I was an automatic um, uh, washer. So they gave me a commission in the Army. And at that, at that time, the Canadian Army wasn't, uh, wasn't doing an awful lot uh, uh, that interested, that caught my particular interest. So I, I mustered out and on my way to try and raise money to get back into university. I'm getting sidetracked, but I, I played the five-string banjo, and I thought I could make a little money, and I ended up spending my Queen's tuition um, in Kelowna bars, playing in bars but not getting paid for it, and consuming too much of the, uh, of the product. It, and that's when I walked into, into Vancouver, um, mostly because my buddy who had the car and played the 12-string banjo was going that way, and I was broke and uh, walked into CJOR radio station in Vancouver, which was uh, sort of the lowest rated station in the market, but had just hit on talk radio with a great, um, very controversial, but a great talk show host called Pat Burns, um, and they needed an operator. So I started doing a little operating to make a little bit of money, living in a garage, literally living in a garage, um, and then doing time and temperature breaks, and because of... Uh, a, a husky voice, I guess, initially, but certainly not a trained voice, began doing, uh, reading all-night newscasts to taped, to taped uh, programming, and wandered in that way. Very slow and erratic, taken under the wing. It was WKRP, uh, older broadcasters, except for Burns, um, and basically I apprenticed, and it was a long and slow and, and clumsy route. Anyway, jumping back to, uh, to the CBC, um, Lloyd left the CBC because he was, in those days, the union didn't allow, I was just saying when we came up, when I arrived at the CBC, there's no way any journalist could touch a microphone. You couldn't move the microphone on the desk of the National. You couldn't reposition the chair. You couldn't touch your face if the makeup wasn't right. It was very narrowly defined um, rights and responsibilities. And Lloyd left because Lloyd is... Uh, still today and was back then one of the best live event commentators. He was a great journalist, but the CBC union wouldn't allow him to live, to, to evolve with journalism as the CBC was just beginning to think of, of changing. They saw him as an announcer. They saw him as a reader. They saw him as nothing else. So quite smartly, CTV came along and said, Lloyd, we think you're a good journalist. And they knew... Uh, a good, audience, good part of the audience would follow him. We want you to come over and co-anchor with Harvey Kirk, and we think you'll be great together. Lloyd quite intelligently did, and I was the beneficiary of all that because all of a sudden 
The CDC had the opportunity, although we were devastated that he was gone, but we had a chance to say, okay, we're going to change the job description of the guy who reads the National, and eventually we're going to do it with all of the anchors on all of the CBC's news programs. So I was hired as a journalist. I was hired and allowed to write my own copy, which Lloyd had never... Lloyd could do it ad lib, and there was no way they could stop him, and the live event, but when it came to reading the National, he was allowed absolutely no latitude at all. So those were great years for me. It was a lot of fun. I got into trouble with the CBC a couple of... My first night reading the National, by the way, was the night René Levesque was elected... Uh, Premier of Quebec, the first uh, separatist government in Canada, so it was a real uh, initiation by fire, and it was just uh, it was a hoot. It was, a, it was just a great time. After two years, though, and it sort of this comes full circle to the Strombolopolis event uh, this past summer, uh, we were being uh, preempted by National League hockey games every spring, um, but one night, uh, and it was in the middle of the winter, I think the Nashville Country Music Awards knocked the National from 11 o'clock back to sometime after midnight. And I got so angry, and it was probably, I was probably being a little too precious, that the CBC's license was coming up for renewal that year, and I wrote an intervention saying the CBC license should not be renewed unless the National uh, takes priority over entertainment, particularly non-Canadian entertainment programming. Uh, and... Not surprisingly, although in my ignorance I never thought it would get to that, the president of the CBC became a huge cause celeb. The president of the CBC almost died of an asthma attack when it was when he read it in the front page of the Globe and Mail. Um, I had to testify. I was taken off the air, and they created the Africa Bureau for the first Africa Bureau of the CBC, and sent me off into exile, which actually was the best thing that could have happened to me because I had a, a, a couple of really good years there. I was hired by NBC out of the Joburg Bureau and worked Africa for them for a couple of years um, and met my wife there. I met and married three weeks before coming back to start the journal. Uh, when, Star, when Starwood started the journal, um, he called in a lot of favors and uh, I was one of the people, uh, troublemakers, perceived the time that was repatriated and we had a great couple of years um, cranking up the journal. Unfortunately, it died, as, as some in this room would know, of when uh, the inter nicene rivalry at the CBC between the National and the Journal, um, the, the news guys prevailed in the early 90s, and the Journal was shut down. I thought prematurely, but for better or for worse, the Journal, uh, which became a great, an, an instant national tradition back in uh, 1982, um, but it, it lived, it, it ran its course, and it, it's now history. And Barbara Frum is um, remembered mostly in the uh, in the foyer of the broadcast building. So there you go. I mean, I've left around a little bit just to talk a bit about uh, American em employment of Canadians. Um, I went. I left the Journal, and the Journal was was really riding high in 1984. But I reconciled. I'd left NBC to come back to the Journal, and they were a little bit. The noses were out of joint, and there was basically a, a, a feeling at Rockefeller Plaza that anybody that left and gave up such a wonderful opportunity, and it, and it was a great opportunity to work uh, for the Peacock Network, that you'd burn your bridges and you'd never get back. For some reason, uh, well, no, I know the reason, that they were short on reporters willing to go into Salvador and Nicaragua for the uh, Central American Wars of the early 80s. Um, and I was getting a little restless back here because the CBC, as as well funded as we were, didn't have the toys, didn't have the um, the resources to get out and cover big international stories as completely as I'd experienced in my previous couple of years with NBC back in the 70s. So um, I reconciled. We moved to Miami, um, got away from winter, uh, which was again it was a uh, that was part of the motivation. We had a young a young child at the time, and. Uh, just had a great time again with NBC until the uh, Berlin Wall came down. I was by then I was chief European correspondent for NBC News out of London, uh, and we had a great time. But I was away 200 uh, the final year, 220 days out of the year. It's great working for an American uh, news organization, but they own you. And uh, I was hauled back on holidays more times than I can forget. Um, uh, Christmases, New Year's. First days, none of that counts if they need your body on an assignment somewhere. That said, for a single person, for a person without an infant or a mortgage, it's a great life. And 
I brought my little brother in, too, who um, the scud stud. I don't know if any of you have read his book, Risk and Redemption. He came into NBC first as a freelancer, uh, working for us in Afghanistan, and then as, as the Rome bureau chief. And we had a great time. Uh, I left before he did because of uh, family and moved back to the States and worked for um, for um, a private uh, station in Boston, um, a, a church run by the uh, Christian Science Church, uh, although it was a very secular uh, television operation with a lot of refugees from the... Uh, the U.S. networks. Um, Walter Cronkite's former producer, Sandy Sokolow, started started up the news site. It was great. Anyway, my, my little brother back in Rome became a celebrity in the first Gulf War, uh, and NBC wanted to repatriate him and exploit that on in, in the American domestic market. He didn't want to come back. He liked international news coverage, so they tried to beat him into coming back, uh, and he wouldn't. Um, so then they tried to pressure him by saying his crew would suffer if he didn't come back. And he said, well, you can't make my crew suffer on my behalf. So they assigned him into Bosnia, uh, and he refused to go because he said, you're only doing this and you're putting their lives at risk, not for a story, but because you're trying to force me to come back to the States. So they put out a whispering campaign to writers in the United States, entertainment writers in the States, Secret, a very secret, deliberate, ordered by the president of NBC News, saying, put out the whispering campaign, the Scud Stud's really a coward. He won't go to Bosnia. Well, I don't know if you've ever crossed paths with Arthur, but he's a pretty volatile personality, and he went nuts. He flew back over to New York and, and made a whole bunch of leaflets up and stood outside Rockefeller Plaza on the street. I was up in Boston at the, uh, at the at Monitor Television, and people were coming over. John Palmer came over and said, what's your brother doing? He's nuts. They're going to kill him. But he was handing out these pamphlets saying, this is why NBC News is wrong, and these are the principles, and they've, now they've fired my Rome crew in retaliation to, you know, to me continuing this fight. And I think the Wall Street Journal headline said, this Kent leaflets tall buildings. But it took off. He launched a lawsuit um, um, through a law firm that had represented him when he'd made a Canadian um, tax shelter movie in the early 80s, 1982 here, uh, it's called Class of 1984, um, which Newsweek reviewed at the time as um, was Blackboard Jungle with Herpes. It was a real violent movie. It never went anywhere. You can still buy it in, in, in video rental shops, but it's on the, it's on the real high-end violence end of the spectrum. Uh, oh, it was Fox's first movie as a teenager. He played a, he played a hood, no all things. Uh, so anyway, Arthur Hyde, that, the law firm that had represented him in making that movie, and they took NBC to court, sued them for $25 million, and I won't go through the whole story. Risk and Redemption, if you want to go to the library and find the book, it's a great read about a little... Uh, High principle journalist fighting against a mega corporation, which was really General Electric more than NBC by then. Um, and he won. He didn't get $25 million. The law firm got more than half of whatever he did get. It's still a secret. He's sworn to secrecy for, I think, another five years before he can say what he did get. But he did win. Uh, he ended up buying an avid edit suite, setting himself up in, in Europe, uh, producing documentaries for the U.S. History Channel and PBS and some CBC stuff. Uh, and he's still, um, I mean, he's living the ideal journalist life now because he picks and chooses what he does. He's still on the high principle then, and you can still, if you ever get a chance to have him here, all you have to do is say NBC, and he'll he'll erupt right in front of your um, your face and give you a great uh, 15 or 20 minutes of uh, diatribe on, on journalistic ethics principles and bad employers. So anyway, I've talked far too much here. Um, and eaten up almost half the time, so I'd love to take questions if uh, if you've got some, hopefully. Yeah, and I'm going to try to get the microphone to you so that uh, we can pick up uh, the questions. Um, so you want me to leave this the, the lab on, Chris? Well, I, you know what, I'll, I'll use this if I need to uh, pipe up, but I don't think I do. I'll just leave this here, and then I'll...
Hi. Hello. Um, my question is a little off of what you were talking about. Okay. It's about um, the current, uh, I guess, Canadian-American perspective on the war in Afghanistan. And yes. Iraq. I know that um, it was highly supported when it started, and now consensus. Afghanistan. Is, yeah, yep. is yep. going. Yeah, Afghanistan is going towards um, removing troops, Canadian troops. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think the, as a politician, um, what, do you, what do you think the um, social responsibility of Canada is to stay there? In Afghanistan? Yeah, in, in light of public opinion. Sure. Like the conflict of that. Well, I think the biggest challenge in this and any other real hot button topic, and Canada has tended, uh, for so many years Canada has been sort of out of international affairs in a proactive way. We've been peacekeepers. We sent peacekeepers to Somalia most recently, and we sent them uh, to the South Pacific. The, and the other thing is, a lot of Canadians still, and I don't want to, well, I must criticize them, they're not very complete in their consumption of the news. They still sort of equate Iraq and the United States involvement in Iraq with Afghanistan and Canada's involvement, very different involvement, and the, the roots of that in, involvement are very different from from uh, from Iraq. Uh, I was looking at the wires this morning, and uh, in Iraq, uh, 43 Americans were killed this month alone, um, compared to, ironically, 43 for Canada in in the entire deployment so far, past couple of years. I think there's a the issue here, and whatever you think of the, the pluses or minuses of Canadian troops assigned under NATO, is framing the issue. It, it's always a matter politically of how issues are framed. Um, I think that it's true that in some ways um, the mission was very well framed when the Conservative government came to power back in, in February, um, when the Prime Minister demonstrated his support by flying to Afghanistan and basically giving General Hillier um, everything he, he, he believed was necessary to do what was, seemed to be required at that time. Uh, I think that, and, and the Christie Blatchfords, and Christie spent a lot of time there this year. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan when the Russians were there. Um, and I haven't been back since the, since the NATO force went in. But Christie Blatchford, we talked about this. Somehow the, the commitment of the troops and their willingness to stand up for the principle uh, that's involved in, in the West's uh, involvement in Afghanistan isn't being consumed by the general public. Um, the men and women of the Canadian forces from Hillier right down to the guys that are coming back missing um, parts of their bodies. Uh, and very often the families of those that, that have been killed say he or she was there doing what, what she believed in and we believe the mission is right. And they obviously they think about it a lot more than, than mainstream Canadians think about it because they're in the military. They're, from the day they come in, they're told you may one day have to kill. You may one day have to put your life on the line. One day you may have to. So I think that it, I think it's good to debate this. I think it's good to talk about it. I think it's, it's good to... Um, to re-examine it at every practical opportunity, uh, but personally, I believe that there is there is a, a good reason for us to be in Afghanistan. Um, I believe in civil reconstruction. I believe in finding a way to co-opt the uh, the uh, the opium, the poppy warlords. I think it'd be very easy, and it wouldn't cost a lot of money to give the the, the Afghan peasant farmers what they are now getting from the warlords for their poppy crop. That's, there's not very much money involved there. Where, where it gets out of hand is where the warlords start um, passing it up the chain and, and uh, before it hits incredible street value in, you know, around the world. So there are God knows, any, any number of issues, but I think it, it's a little silly when we hear from some quarters, and I won't name names or, or parties or individuals, it's a bit silly to say we should be spending more on reconstruction when really any reconstruction that's done now, in, in a, certainly in the South, is, is going to be counterproductive. We're going to lose the people who are doing the reconstruction, the people who are using the reconstruction. 
Um, and the failure will seem even greater to those who have doubts about why we're there in the first place. So, I'm, if I understand correctly, you, you support... I believe we should be in Afghanistan. Yeah. So, how do you... I'm, although you're not an elected official, um, how do you sort of deal with the conflict between, I guess, the potential of, of being pulled out of Afghanistan and mm-hmm. your your belief that it, you know we're there for a you know specific reason because a lot of a lot of politics is based on public opinion. Oh no, absolutely. And governments, principal governments, are willing to fall uh, if they don't. I mean, leading public opinion is the challenge for uh, in un, un, with unpopular causes is the challenge for any politician. Uh, in the 90s, it was pretty easy uh, for federal politics because the Conservative Party was divided and, you know, there was no viable opposition. And really, it was possible to play the public opinion on just about every issue of the, of the day. Uh, and we saw where that got us in terms of Quebec and ad scam and, you know, things got pretty much off the, off the rails. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I can remember going to Vietnam for the first time in 1966, and I believed then that that was a just war. Um, after the Tet Offensive in 68 and the, the fact that the administration and Congress wasn't prepared. They could have won in Vietnam, but they they didn't commit beyond South Vietnam and bombing sort of industrial areas in the north. Um, and it prob- what they would have probably had to do to win would have been even more un- unacceptable to American public opinion than the fact that there were 500,000 young men there and, you know, what, 50,000 of them were casualties. So... Uh, but there were those who basically stood on in their belief and, and were defeated because of it. Now, I think the justific- justification for Canadians and NATO troops in Afghanistan is much greater than for the United States at that time in South Vietnam. It's, that wasn't retributive. That was um, reactive. That was preemptive. Um, the NATO deployment in Afghanistan is still to get bin Laden and eliminate the Taliban. And I think part of the problem there is, and until very recently, Canadians and Americans have been hesitant to criticize Musharraf in Pakistan. And I think that essentially, whether he's doing it willingly or because he's not capable of enforcing the law on his side of the Afghan border, um, I think the solution to what's going on with the Taliban eventually lies in, in the northwest frontier of, of Pakistan. Uh, you mentioned that you're working with Jane Pitfield's uh, yes. campaign. Uh, as a journalist, you're, you're aware of how damaging plagiarism can be. How is this going to affect Jane Pitfield's campaign? Well, we'll see. Um, as you know, web blogs are sometimes administered by, by others. She's out on, on the road an awful lot. I haven't been. I wasn't, haven't been on the inside of the discussions that, that have taken place. Obviously, it, it was wrong to lift that. Uh, it, it was incredibly wrong, and she was mortified when she found out that that uh, someone on the team had been embellishing the content of of the blog site with basically straight lists. Um, will it be fatal? I, I don't know. I mean, the amazing thing about the about the this Merrill campaign is for a sitting mayor to have so many ordinary people feeling that he hasn't accomplished what he, what he said he would do. Um, Jane is, some of her supporters have come on board since the, the petition or the, um, the poll in the National Post a couple of weeks ago that showed that she was more or less neck and neck with, uh, with David Miller. A lot of the people that jumped on board weren't there earlier because they don't think that she's the ideal candidate, but she's the best thing they've got to support. Um, and a lot of us believe that after watching the budget debates back in the winter and most recently pulling out, you know, forcing uh, disclosure of the secret landfill deal, the single sourcing debate with Bombardier on subway cars that probably cost, I believe, maybe $100 million to Torontonians more than than it, it could have. Um, and the contradiction, say, on the island airport where the mayor says, um, we've got to shut the airport down, and he doesn't care about the jobs at Downsview that are building the planes, but he does care about the jobs at Bombardier and Sault Ste. Marie regarding the subway cars. So there's, there's a little bit of 
contradiction in terms of, of logic. So whether or not the blog, I mean, the blog thing is wrong. She came out and, and disavowed it. I mean, it, I think it's great that the, that the, um, that the uh, students that discovered it did discover it. I mean, I, I think that that uh, if we can't have transparency and honesty and accountability, then, you know. So if, if, that, if that by itself means enough to Toronto voters to de- not to vote for, then it'll prove to be fatal. Somehow I suspect not. Um, and given the fact that we've seen, you know, the, in a different dimension, the Volpe campaign contributions from children, and the, I mean, the, there are an awful lot of political activists working for different candidates in different levels who do things which the candidates themselves are horrified at you, more more things are shut down that we never hear about um, outrageous concepts that a that a campaign militant says well why don't we do this or why don't we go tear down candidate X's signs or why don't we put a Hitler mustache on that guy um, and the, the candidates almost always are horrified that that goes on there's a few of them don't want to know about it but aren't that disturbed when it happens but for the most part it's you know. We've got to take um, politicians or, or uh, potential politicians at their word that they take the high road rather than, un- until we catch them on the low. Hi. Um, I'd just like to continue along the same uh, path that we were earlier in terms of the war, simply because uh, I find your experience as a journalist and then coming into uh, being a politician to be very interesting. So what I'm curious about is in terms of the concept of the embedded journalist. Yes. Um, and there has been some criticism in terms of the object, objectivity that is lost from being in this type of position. I was hoping sure. maybe you could weigh in on that. Sure. Well, I think we need both. I think embedding is good because it gets you places that you're not going to get if you're standing on the side of the road. I mean, there was a day, and again, not to deal on, on the past because it, it will never come back to this. When I first went to Vietnam in 66, I got a, once I was accredited and accepted by the Vietnamese government and the uh, Mac, Mac V, the military assistant command from the Americans, I could hop on helicopters. I rode in the back seat of a Sabre jet on a bombing mission, went to the DMZ, on, on, worked in fire bases. You could go anywhere. You could literally go anywhere. After Tet and after journalists began to report the losing aspect or the non-winning aspect of the war with a great loss of, of, um, of troops, uh, the military then saw the press as the enemy, and we were pushed so far away that by you know 1975, when the end came in both Cambodia and, and Vietnam, we were lucky. You know, sometimes the CIA guys would let us on planes to get around, but the military officially said, you know, you guys are the enemy, and that was basically the, the relationship. During the Second Gulf War, the prime value of embedding to me came when, I forget his name, ah, the older journalist, CNN journalist, and he basically, with a used Humvee bought in Kuwait City, Outfitted with a variety of uplinking dishes and and uh, and satellite controllers, was able to give us live shots of a camera out the door of the Humvee in the armored column heading to Baghdad. You know, it it didn't it didn't tell us much about how the war itself was going. But boy, you know, for 30 years we've been saying one day we'll be able to broadcast live from conflict locations. And I thought, wow, in this little used no, no, it, it, it's no, 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 no. Uh, I met with working friends. He said, "No, it's, it's Walter. Walter. He, he's an older journalist. I mean, the other thing was it, it was great proof that, that you can retread a guy who hasn't been in a combat situation for a long time. Walter. Anyway, Google it. Um, small guy, out of shape." Um, uh, sort of would look more at home in a golf course. Uh, but he did some of the neatest reporting. And again, it was all, and he, he was very careful. He knew that he was only seeing this much of the battlefield. And he didn't try and say, you know, this is the strategy and so forth. All he knew is what his little column saw. But it was, you know, Arnett on the rooftop in Baghdad during the, during the, uh, the cruise missile strike. I mean, again... It doesn't tell you an awful lot. They didn't know what the explosions were, what was being hit, who was being killed, but it was 
gripping live history, you know, and for that it was interesting. In Afghanistan, we've got, uh, most of our people are embedded in Can at Kandahar Air Base. Uh, and they go out in, in, uh, within a, a military uh, unit. Some of them have done um, civil reconstruction beyond the military. They, you know, they basically they sign out at the, at the gates of the air base and they go out and do this. But they are natural targets for the Taliban in this case. Um, and, and basically, in some ways, they know that they draw attention to the civilians they talk to and who are civil back to them in, in, so that even if they don't become the, the, uh, the focus of an attack, those civilians that, that cooperate with them or take them into their homes or take them into their um, fields will become targets. So there's a, a bit of an ethical compromise there. But it, uh, I think in an ideal situation, there's nothing wrong with the embed. If the, if the journalist who's embedded is principled and fearless in the sense that, and we've had some of our uh, print journalists uh, in, uh, in Can West News Services have been sent home because they stood up for principles that they believed uh, uh, some of the operating rules that the military had was imposing. The interpretation of some of the rules that they'd accepted at the beginning of the assignment, but that, uh, that the journalist said, you're not you're not imposing the, the rules that I agreed to. What you're trying to do is cover your butt on an embarrassing incident, you know, which either puts somebody at risk or whatever. Uh, so if the, if the journalist is strong, um, then embedding is, and honest, then, then embedding works. Um, my question is something a little bit more local. Um, sure. From a political standpoint, um, the new bill that will be, um, that they're trying to put through about, more severe consequences for repeat sex offenders. Yes. Um, now, obviously, the benefits are they're keeping these people off the streets and out of community, but also uh, something that you could think that would be just a problem with it is that it would be overcrowding the jail system. What are your views on this, uh, and like, what do, what do you think the benefits and uh, non-benefits are? Well, yeah, it's a good question. They, I mean, crime and punishment is, I mean, it's, it's always, it's, it's an evergreen issue. Um, but if society, I, mean, I believe that if society is really going to um, uh, administer justice fairly and honestly, uh, both from the point of view of, of the perpetrator and the victim and society at large, then if that means more, more prisons have to be built to accommodate greater numbers of incarcerated people, then that's what you have to do. But at the same time, Yesterday, the statistics that came out of the Justice Department were that last year, that would have involved only 50 people. And at, the, at this point this year, that there would probably be 30 cases before the courts involved in long-term incarceration. So, I mean, it's not a huge impact, maybe over 20 years, depending on um, sort of accumulated numbers, that may be a problem. Or on the other hand, if, if, um, if some of the other programs that are sorely needed to keep people out of jail, you know, starting from kindergarten up, perhaps then there won't be as many people that, that are in need of, of permanent uh, protection from themselves and, uh, and society. So, I, I mean, it's a good question, and I, I think that um, the criminal defense lawyer's point of view is not, I mean, it has to be considered. Um, but the fact is, in some cases, we have seen judges turn very dangerous people back onto the streets or into parental custody, you know, and they immediately recommit. Uh, and to do it because the Don Jail's overcrowded or, you know, a, a local um, facility's overcrowded, I think that's, that's wrong. You didn't know you were going to get scrubbed today like you were <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, earlier you talked about uh, politics being harder than you thought. Yes. Um, what is the most single thing that surprised you in politics? Well, from my point of view, and don't judge me harshly on this, I always thought I was a fairly logical person, you know, and that given a choice of policies and individuals associated with policies or platforms that the electorate would make, you know, an obvious choice. Um, 
I think that south of the 401, 416 is still not quite ready. There are a lot of people who voted conservative in more than ever in recent years, but I still think that there is a, and again, this is a partisan guy's opinion. Don't, this is not a journalist speaking. But I believe that there has been a certain amount of conditioning in the 90s about when, when the Conservative Party was in the wilderness, sort of divided into uh, far center-right and farther-right, uh, that it became easy to demonize the Alberta guys. Um, and in 2004, that made it impossible. I mean, that re-elected the Martin government. Um, we did a little better last time, but there are still people who believe they kept the barbarians at the gates um, in terms of Toronto. And just to share it with you, although there's nothing specific at the moment, I suspect that uh, if I really want to win whenever the next election happens, I'll be probably north of the 401 somewhere. Um, you just said that... Um uh, this is a partisan guy's opinion. I'm yeah. not speaking from a journalist point of view. Yep. So, standing here in front of us, are you a journalist or a politician? Um, well, standing here today, I'm a, I, I guess you'd say I'm a retired journalist. I'm, I'm out of the editorial flow at Can West. Basically, what I do there is enable uh, technology, infrastructure. We're installing a digital, um, an all digital newsroom in, in global uh, in the next few months. Uh, I work with the newspapers to so that we can repurpose all of the content they generate into a more productive um, um, uh, television uh, and, and internet, Canada.com uh, form. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I burnt my bridges. I, I couldn't go back to, to claiming to be a straight journalist. I could be a columnist, and if I, if I was a good enough columnist, I might find myself on the front page of a newspaper, but I would still say that I'd be a journalist in the, you know, in a very narrow definition of the, of the word. You've uh, mentioned at the start of your discussion uh, what Jim Harris called you. Yes. Uh, the unelected... Uh, oh, a faceless broadcast yeah, executive. Yeah. Oh, do you want to explain why? The reason why I did that was because of your position... Uh, to the Green Party's involvement in the televised debate. In the official debate, that's right. Now, my question is, considering the current situation, yes. you've got a minority government, the environment seems to be the weak spot or a blind spot. You've the got uh, the Green Party as a new leader. You don't know who's going to be the leader of the Liberal Party and what that influence will be on the next election. Exactly. Have you changed your position on... on well, I'm no longer... Just to backtrack, the reason Jim Harrison, I like Jim, he's a good guy, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that the Green Party has chosen a conservative to lead them in Elizabeth May. It's, I think it's wonderful. Um, I used to sit on the consortium of CTV, CBC, and Global, and we broadcast the official leaders' debate every, every, uh, every federal election. And the tradition has been, as long as I can remember, that the only leaders invited to participate are those who have at least one seat in Parliament. Um, and, and there are other debates, and all of us under the broadcast licenses that we have from the CRTC uh, compel us to have the leader of the Green Party and a number of the other uh, unrepresented parties into debate situations and to give full exposure to those platforms proportionately um, uh, during campaigns. So basically what we had done is said, and the debate was, if you, if you make an exception, then you open the door. And the courts have basically said, I mean, they've defended our right to, to set the bar at at least one seat in Parliament. Um, and the problem is, um, uh, if the Green Party came in at whatever it was, 4% last time, then some other grouping of candidates might say, well, we got 4% between us and we're calling ourselves the such and such, and so they would want on. Um, so, I mean, that's basically why, why, why they haven't been, been, been put in. I think Elizabeth May is getting a lot of coverage now, and it's true the Green Party will have great impact on the environmental platforms of the Liberals, because even the Bloc uh, has, has, uh, has been touched by, uh, by Elizabeth May's 
you know, new passion. And I, you know, I hope, I personally, I'd love to see her get a seat. And I think that she finally is going to be a little more pragmatic than Jim Harris was, because what he did was spread, he saw it was more important to run a candidate in every riding. I think it would be much more important to run candidates where you can win and then put, you know, if you've got to airlift people to that riding to, to get that person elected, then you go where you can, and BC, I would think, would be the first logical place. But I mean, some of the candidates, just to get the numerical representation, there were civil servants in Ottawa who were born in Nova Scotia who stood as green candidates last time, you know, and they hadn't been home in years, and it was really, it looked good to say, but we're running somebody in every riding, but they weren't really, uh, it, it, it was a little bit of a confection. Peter Nakar with you. How hey, are you? how are you? Good. Um, it was Walter Rogers. That's right. Walter Rogers, that's it. Yeah. CNN. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, actually, if you go to the CNN website, you can probably find some of his um, the highlights of his expedition. It was, it was good. Yeah. Walt Rogers. Um, Richard James Gitmo campaign and Stephen Drew coming in. Yes. Uh, do you think that would split the kind of vote? That was the intention of. Stephen's a friend of mine, and I tried to get him not to go in, and uh, I think that he was persuaded by people on one level, but they are using him for very different, they were using him as, as a possible device to split the vote. Stephen says that, and he still he said it several times, I think he's muddied the water a bit, uh, but on the other hand, he's also been a good... Uh, He's been an interesting ingredient into some of the debates because he's forced Miller to to address some issues that Pittfield might not have chased him on. Um, I think that Stephen's been badly bruised. John Barber has just... Uh, I think Stephen has some skeletons in his closet that deserve to be revealed, but I think John Barber has been uh, unnecessary, br unnecessarily brutal, dragging his wife into it and questioning the relationship and maybe just, just in any event Stephen says that if at some point closer to election day he senses he's not he doesn't have a shot he will throw his support behind Jane um, whether or not he's got support to throw I, I don't know I mean I, I enjoy him I think he's a we hired him at Global to do the final round with uh, Ezra Levant on Global Sunday a couple of years ago, and he still does it on Global National. And it's kind of fun to see two people having a good old dinner table argument on, on television, you know, a little like Point Counterpoint. Or, uh, uh, but I think that, that Stephen was convinced to run based on ego, and that the people who, who played, who, who buttered him up, had a an agenda, a different agenda of their own. I don't think that they thought he'd win, but I, did, I do think they thought he'd be a complication for Jane. Hi. Um, over the past four years, you've done uh, extensive coverage of uh, many wars. Yes. And uh, you just said that you consider yourself to be a logical person. And I guess my question would be, after um, seeing so much firsthand, after seeing firsthand so much of this, uh, devastation and other social injustices that result from war. Um, I guess I was wondering if you could clarify for me the logic of then joining the Conservative Party, especially under Stephen Harper. Oh, well, it, well, uh, because I believe, I went, I mean, I was a journalist and I suppressed my inclinations over 40 years, the political in inclinations, whether I was covering wars or the Ethiopian famine or South African apartheid. I mean, basically, you report the facts and you report um, in a fair and balanced manner, but you're, you're generally trying to think, you, you expose what, what you believe is, is right and just and fair and accurate. Um, I went to the conservative convention last year as a journalist. We took Global Sunday there um, and basically saw the reconstituted party create a policy document that to me, as a lifelong, as never a card-carrying PC, but as a lifelong, fierce, fiscal, and broad-minded social conservative, um, I thought, wow, at last they have defined you know, women's rights. Had the, the plank there was, was straightforward and direct and, and honest. Same-sex marriage allowed um, 
The party allows on social, uh, all social policy votes, uh, the conscience of the candidate and or the constituency that he represents to, to vote their conscience. Uh, I could walk in the gay pride parade and still be embraced by, um, uh, if not embraced by some of my Western uh, fellow candidates, at least they accepted my right to do that as a, as a member of the new Conservative Party. So I came back from that and I thought, wow, uh, in, and in, instead of paying lip service to international issues, I felt, um, I don't want to make a stump speech here, uh, instead of paying lip service to world affairs and trying to do the very least with a, uh, with a, um, uh, an underfunded, undermanned military, you know, we sort of, we lived, we lived the reputation or still played on our reputation of Pearsonian peacemaking, but we didn't stand up at the, we, we went with the wind at the United Nation in votes against Israel, for example. Um, we went, uh, we, we kept begging off uh, peacekeeping assignments that we were asked to take part in unless somebody else would drive us there. Um, and I just thought, for example, I, when I saw the Francophony, which is a little bit of a joke these days because it, it's got an awful lot of nations that are hardly part of the classic Francophony as I, as I knew it. But I thought it was great when, uh, if, if Stephen Harper hadn't been in Romania and stood up and said, hey, let's recognize all of the civilian victims in the Middle East um, flare up this summer, not just uh, one particular group associated with one particular side. If he hadn't stood up and said, I'm not going to sign that, France would have signed it. Um, some of the larger, larger members of the Francophony, secondary to, to France, would have signed it. And I thought it was, I mean, that, that sort of uh, uh, defense of principle is what got me on board in the first place, and it still got me. Just a couple of quickies. I wondered if you could return to the subject you began with, and that was a kind of projection of an ideal national news broadcast that you even made reference to. CBC or, pub or private? Uh, well, CBC would be ideal, but even okay. private. My, my question had to do with really the, uh, the, the reference specifically then to TDO, perhaps it was Studio 2, but certainly sure. Steve Paken. And it has to do first then with how we get there. Uh, what within policy and beyond do you recommend people working in this field do, and Canadians more generally do, to move toward the idea which you projected, I thought rather attractively, for So my second question was simply this. What can journalists and edit editors do within the field of print journalism to stimulate more critical thinking skills among Canadians generally on any issue, and as a result, perhaps, to have people buy papers and read papers and listen to news broadcasts that don't merely reflect existing views? Sure. Well, it's, well, one, we have to engage the public. Um, if, if you look at public opinion polls, there are an awful lot of positions that haven't changed substantially for quite a few years. Uh, but until the people who are asking the questions begin to construct the questions in such a way... I mean, you can see great, uh, there were great contradictions in last year's election campaign, before the campaign last fall. And I forget whether it was Ipsos um, or not. But basically, they asked a bunch of questions which were designed to reveal the lack of understanding of the general public on a whole number of big issues. And one of them was, I remember, was, Canadian, was the Canadian forces. Should Canada take a larger role in international affairs? Yes. Should Canada uh, have more peacekeepers? Should Canada uh, deploy them more widely around the world in places like Darfur, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, uh, Sri Lanka. Yes. I mean, these are huge numbers, 80%, 80%, 80%. Will, do you believe the tax allotment to the Canadian forces should be increased? Yes. Are you willing to pay more taxes to support the Canadian forces? 80% no. I mean, so, I mean, there's a disconnect between, sometimes Canadians have a certain wishful thinking about what, what we are, what we can do, what we should do, and what we individually are willing uh, to contribute to get that done. And the same in the balance of um, when literacy programs, a certain sort of adult literacy program was cut a couple of weeks ago, um, along with the status of women uh, administration and so forth, $200 million, or somewhere close to $200 million in the spring budget was focused on literacy. 
a lot of these programs were programs that had been started in some place. Some of them were, were doing their job but had perhaps outlived them. A couple of them were found to have been started at a time uh, in an election campaign, in a previous election campaign, as a political sort of goodie. Um, I won't blame anybody for that. I mean, that's what happens in election campaigns, unfortunately. Getting back to the CBC, I think part of the problem with the CBC is to address the political issue. There, the board is heavily politicized. The regional board of the CBC is heavily politicized, and past governments, Mulroney's government and Cretchen's government, and certainly Martin's government, handed to the Quebec CBC board because they play to the political, I mean, they see it as a, a, a separatist, federalist issue. Um, and they're given private, uh, private affiliates of the CBC in Quebec have become very wealthy just carrying CBC news either on Radio Canada or the, or the National. But then they're allowed to put whatever other programming on and reap those profits entirely. And they don't really contribute to the CBC. But they're, they're, they're little flag posts and the, the, Successive governments in Ottawa have long seen those little flag posts as a defense against separatism. I think that's unrealistic in the day of satellite transmission. We don't need private affiliates of the CBC anymore. We need a good, strong uh, national broadcaster into which all of the seven or eight hundred billion dollars, uh, million dollars of tax money, and, that, and it serves all Canadians. And it serves the region too, but we, to have all of these little stations which are semi-private, not public, um, uh, I don't think serves it. Next, you've got to have um, Bob Rabinovich tried to, to change. Uh, Patrick Watson in his day tried to change it. But they're always beaten down by this heavily politicized board of directors. Um, uh, basically, I think that basically it will take the political courage um, and the right appointment. I mean, Richard Sturzberg, who's the current... Uh, head of CBC English Television, uh, seems to be considered by his critics in, in the arts and, and humanities and, and who value national public broadcasting as a bit of a failure, but he's going off. I mean, the Strombos, George's The One was, was a fairly foolish thing for a national public broadcaster to do. It was, it, I mean, it doesn't fit anywhere even in the original mandate. Uh, so, I, I basically, tough, principled leadership, and uh, uh, the national is, CBC News is an incredibly wonderful organization. I was just the Gemini presenting awards two nights ago. It, uh, I, I presented five news awards, um, and I think out of 30 names mentioned, there were three that weren't CBC. Uh, fortunately, three of them were global. Um, they weren't the winners, unfortunately. But the CBC National has, its audience has diminished. It now is third ranked in the country. Global National at 530 gets a much larger audience than CBC at 10 or its other airings on Newsworld. Uh, and CTV uh, National at 11 is right behind Kevin at 530. So it's, uh, viewing habits have change. And, and, and you've got to, we admit certainly that CBC should be doing, in Kandahar right now, Global and the CBC are co-funding the satellite uplink base. Uh, and we operate that. We shift resources, human resources, engineers. We have our own reporters, and we, there's a firewall between what we do journalistically and what they do journalistically in the transmission. But in terms of, of, of cooperating, we've created that pool. We do this I mean, domestically. We're pooling all over the place. CTV doesn't want to play there. They're sort of off on their own uh, for the moment. But it's... Um, We've got to think out of the box, I think. We can't, it's not the 50s anymore, and the CBC isn't the only show in town. Uh, but I, I passionately believe we need a CBC, and we need what, the, you know, we need the Neil McDonald's, and we need the Tony Berman's, and we need. Uh, uh, and that part of your question about the next forgotten. generation of critical thinkers among journalists and broadcasters. I think I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, where, where are they going to come from? What skills do they need to be that way? Well, it's no, it's no longer a one-way street. And talk radio, I think, and, and, and talk television and stream of consciousness television have shown us that the odd and, and 
certainly the Internet, show us we need to engage with the news consumers that we're serving. Um, uh, and we've got to be careful not to pander to them simply for the numbers that they represent in terms of our survival commercially or, or economically. And, and you see that. I mean, uh, CNN has responded to the, to the fact that Fox is now preeminent in the United States in, in uh, all news audiences by trying to outfox Fox in some areas of their programming. And it, I don't think it wears well, and I don't think it's particularly honest. I mean, um, obviously, if, if you're going to lose your job, if you don't get the numbers that, um, that will enable your employer to maintain that program, uh, you've got to try a little harder. But I think that there are certain lines that you just can't cross. And I think that some of the CNN response to the Fox uh, success has been uh, questionable, if not uh, beyond sort of ethical boundaries. Uh, I would, you know, and again, you listen to talk radio in Toronto. Uh, and if you listen to any one talk radio station long enough, you start to hear a certain pattern of voices. Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid that too many people are just tuning in to their favorite talk show because, it, again, it reinforces their own personal biases and their own, in, in some cases, their own personal ignorance. Uh, it would be nice to see. And uh, CBC does some great town hall engagement exercises on, on public policy, but the numbers, unfortunately, are really disappointing. There's just not a huge audience. Um, the people say they... They watch, but the ratings are there, and they, they, they you know, they, they can't be denied. I just hope that uh, that uh, there's more and better journalism. That uh, people buy more than one newspaper a day, or at least go to more than one newspaper website uh, and expose themselves to conflicting takes. It's, um, you know. I read John Barber all the time, even though I don't agree with an awful lot of what he says. John Ralston Saul, I read all his treatises on uh, on society and the economy, and I don't agree, but but by listening to his logic, I hope it sort of sharpens my the counter-arguments. But it, and again, that's engagement and allows... I've got friends who aren't just conservatives. I've got a lot of friends who are liberals and NDP, and I even have a couple of block friends. Um, you know, and we can still be friends on one level, I mean, Bob Ray is a great pal of mine, but he's my own personal favorite in terms of the eventual liberal leadership, uh, in terms of uh, a worthy candidate for the next election. We've run out of time with the group, but I, I did want to keep you on for a couple minutes more for those who would like to engage you one-on-one -on -one for a few minutes. But um, uh, as I said a moment ago, I don't think you expected to be scrummed on quite as wide an array of issues as you were today. Um, uh, and, and I don't know whether you're going for Minister of Communications or Minister of Social Services or what, but you did I'd be well. happy as a backbencher. <laughs> Whatever happens, we appreciate the time you took. Uh, we appreciate the, some of the war stories. We appreciate the insight to being a journalist and a broadcaster and maybe a politician too. But I come back to what I said before. You're terrifically curious if that's possible, and it's really helped engage us and give us a sense of what um, this profession is all about. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.